Thank you. Um, I'll begin by just reminding you where we had got to at the end of the last lecture. So in the last lecture, we had been talking about the Dickey model, which took this form of a Hamiltonian which described a single cavity mode coupled to many two-level systems um, with energies omega naught over two, sigma i z, plus the interaction between matter and light, which if I don't make the rotating wave approximation, if I do write the full Dickey model, takes this form of sigma i x times a plus a dagger. And what we'd said was that this, this um, model has a phase transition if one can realize 4g squared n greater than omega omega naught, where um, n was the number of two-level systems in this problem. But then what we'd said at the end of this lecture was actually this, this Hamiltonian was missing something. It was missing a term that described the diamagnetic effect of the atoms on the frequency of light in the cavity. So that looked like an extra term psi times a plus a dagger squared. And that had the effect that in this equation, what I really needed was omega plus 4n psi omega naught should be um, the right-hand side of this equation. And then actually we proved that exactly the opposite is true because the Thomas Raikoon sum rule told us that the dipole moment between two levels d naught one squared times omega naught squared was strictly less than the combination sum over all charges within an atom, q alpha squared over 2 m alpha times omega naught. And what we can show is that this psi looks like this thing, and g looks like this combination. And so we get the exact inequality, um, the exact opposite inequality of what we wanted. And so there is this no go theorem due to, due to Zhazhevsky, which says there is no phase transition in this Dickey model. So, so what I'm going to spend today's lecture talking about, yep. Yeah. Yes. So, so the whole of today's lecture is going to be about what ways are there to get around this. Um, so, so maybe leave this question for, for now. Um, yeah, so, so what I'm going to talk about today is ways to get around this. And there are quite a few things I could talk about. Um, what I'm going to try and do is, in the first 15, 20 minutes or so, review in um, not great detail, but to give a basic idea of um, several of the ways of um, asking exactly this kind of question that Marco just asked there, of whether there are limitations in this statement, whether there are ways around this fundamentally. And then in the rest of the lecture, I'm going to talk about one particular way around this in some detail, which is taking a driven dissipative realization of the Dickey model with cold atoms in a cavity, and talk about um, how that gets around the no-go theorem and what that allows you to, to do instead. So, so um, to begin this first part, um, what I should, should comment, um, or what I should say is by way of comment, is that I think there is still an active debate on some of these points. And so what I'm going to attempt to do is to give summaries of both sides of where that debate is, um, and give my own commentary on what I, I think is, is important questions to look at, but I'm not going to necessarily give you a settled, definite answer and a clear resolution of all about that debate. Um, and I will provide a few references at various points of key works that state one or other side of, of the argument, i.e. say that there is a phase transition or there isn't. Um, there are many more papers which you can find in um, the reference lists of the papers that I'm going to talk about. So. The statement with a no-go theorem here had been um, sh shown in around 1975, and there was a sort of 30-year or 40-year quiet period after that, where it sort of seemed that this problem had gone away. But in the last five or 10 years, it's, it's re-emerged, um, partly due to the idea that you can start to build systems that look like this Hamiltonian in context such as superconducting qubits. And um, the... First thing that I want to talk about here is 
the question of whether superconducting qubits plus microwave resonators finds any way around this problem. And, and the reason you might think that it could is that in this context, what you would naturally do is to say, I have a circuit, let me write down a Lagrangian in terms of fluxes. And then from this Lagrangian, I can work out canonical momenta, which are dl, d, um, phi dot. And I can then, from this and the Lagrangian, work out a quantum Hamiltonian. And I can take this approach of writing down a classical field theory whose Euler-Lagrange equations are the classical electromagnetic equations of this problem, and then derive the Hamiltonian. And there are various works which do that for problems of superconducting circuits coupled to microwave resonators. And by doing that, they find a Hamiltonian which looks like the Dickey model, but either have no A squared term or have an A squared term with an arbitrary coefficient. Um, and so the, the particular reference for, that um, started discussing this is by Nataf and Chuti and appeared in Nature Communications. Um, sorry, the volume one, page 72, and said that basically this idea that if you write down the effects of Lagrangian describing various electromagnetic circuits, you find these, these versions of the Dickey model, but without an A squared term, or in some cases, with an A squared term as a different strength. And therefore, if you believe this process, if you believe you've written down the right Lagrangian, then that should suggest that you have a model which is able to undergo a phase transition. And then there are various questions you can ask of, what, was there anything special about the superconducting circuit that allows a way around this? One point that was suggested in this original paper is that there is a, a difference between the form of what you would call atomic Hamiltonian. So in, in all of these statements here, and in particular in the derivation of the Thomas Wright Kuhn sum rule, I assumed that the atomic Hamiltonian looked like P squared um, over 2m, that there was just a a standard kinetic energy term for the electrons. But if you ask what is the um, Lagrangian for a single um, Josephson junction, you get a term which looks like C phi dot squared over two, the charging energy, which depends on voltage, which is time derivative of flux, plus the Josephson energy times cos phi. And if you work in the dual description where you swap the roles of position and momentum, then you have a rather strange form where, if you think of this as um, turning into a momentum-like co coordinate, you get a different form of Hamiltonian, and there was a suggestion that this could be a way around the no-go theorem. Um, so this is one side of the story. The other side of the story in this context is in, um, well, it at least starts in a paper by Wieman et al. Um, with Florian McCard um, and um, Jan von Delft, and this is in PRL, volume 107, page 113602. And this makes, um, and this starts from two, two points, both of which seem sort of straightforward. One is everything is made out of normal electrons and protons. There's, there's no special superconducting matter, it's still made out of charges, and if you break it back down into charges, you will get back to a Hamiltonian which has got a kinetic energy for the charges in the normal way. So something strange must have gone on if you start with a problem which has normal charges, and then you produce this strange kinetic Hamiltonian. And the second point that they made is that what you are really writing down here is a low energy Lagrangian. You're describing, you're writing down a Lagrangian which describes the low energy degrees of freedom of this circuit, but doesn't describe all of the degrees of freedom of this circuit. And what you may worry is whether there are higher energy states outside your description and the virtual transitions from low energy to high energy states lead to some diamagnetic response. You, if you think of these terms in perturbation theory, they will contribute some um, change to the Hamiltonian. And they produced a toy example, which is not 
the superconducting circuit, it's a, it's a different problem, but they had a toy example where you could show exactly that kind of behavior occurred, but when you included virtual fluctuations to higher energy states, you recovered a diamagnetic term. So, so that's one class of story, um, and as I said, I'm not going to resolve the story. There, there, there are really these two papers presenting two sides of this, and many other papers following this which have added weight on either side, but I think the, the question is still somewhat open. Um, one thing which does come out of that is that a, an interesting approach is just to say, well, we can build these superconducting circuit experiments now, and we could just go and build one and see, does it undergo a phase transition when you put enough in? And clearly there can't be anything wrong with an experiment proving a phase transition. Modulo one caveat, which I'll come back to at the end of this discussion. Um, there's a similar story, which I'm not going to say so much about, um, which is that you can also think of what happens in materials like graphene. And what, why would graphene be interesting in this case? Well, if you write down the low energy Hamiltonian for graphene, the low energy Hamiltonian looks like some Fermi velocity times modulus of momentum. And then when you do minimal coupling, you get the Fermi minus um, times P minus modulus EA, it's a linear dispersion, so there's no A squared term. So does this mean that in a material like graphene, the A squared term goes away? But there is again another side to the story which says exactly the same thing as before, which is this is a low energy effect of Hamiltonian. There are higher energy electron states, there are higher bands. If you start to count the effects of higher bands, then actually the answer is quite subtle. And depending exactly how you count them, you can get an answer which is either there's a positive A squared term, or if you get it wrong, a negative A squared term, or if you get it wrong in other ways, arbitrary coefficients. But there is again a a, a possibility there that there's something more subtle about what, what happens in materials which have different, um, different dispersions for the electron. I, I don't want to go into that any further because actually there is also a more profound question of whether the no-go theorem at all really worked. And there are two ingredients to this. Ingredient one, um, so this is whether no-go um, exists at all. Ingredient one for this is that the no-go theorem came about because I looked back at my original Hamiltonian of um, charges interacting with electromagnetic modes and said I had missed something when I wrote down the Dickey model. Well, there was another term which I threw away and didn't come back to discuss at all in yesterday's lecture, and that was the static Coulomb interaction. Um, so originally that looked like um, sum over all charges um, for pi epsilon naught, um, Q alpha, Q beta over modulus R alpha minus R beta. If I do my trick of rewriting everything in terms of dipole moments of atoms, you can turn this into some sum over atoms of dipole moment of atom I, dipole moment of atom J, and then you'll need some extra indices and then there'll be some Green's function that depends on the distance between the atoms and has some tensor structure which will capture the nature of the dipole-dipole interaction. And the point about this term is that this was nowhere in the Dickey model. And this term has some important consequences because of point two, which is about what happens if you think about gauge transformations. And it is known that if you think about making a gauge transform from the Coulomb gauge, which we were working in, to other gauges such as the electromagnetic electric dipole gauge, then there is an interplay between the A squared terms and these Coulomb terms. Specifically, the idea that you separate out the Coulomb static Coulomb interaction and the bit that's carried by transverse electromagnetic fields is a specific statement about the Coulomb gauge. In the Coulomb gauge, you treat only, only the transverse parts of the electric field dynamically, and you have this static Coulomb interaction that deals with all longitudinal parts of the electric field. When you go to the dipole gauge, there is a um, transform which moves some parts of this static Coulomb interaction into something that you would then say is mediated by a dynamic electromagnetic field. 
And at the same time, there are transforms which get rid of parts of the A squared term. And so if you get rid of the A squared term and you get rid of the Coulomb term, then actually what you will get left with is something which is just the Dickey model. You'll just have charges plus electromagnetic modes plus coupling between them. And in that case, you would suggest that there, um, there really could be a, a phase transition of the form described by the Dickey model. And so, so the paper, which, so there are several papers which have built this up bit by bit, particularly um, um, by the group of um, Andres Vukic and Peter Domakosh. The paper which makes the most strong statement at the end of this, this sequence is um, Vukic et al. and is published in PRL, and that's volume 112. 073601. But there are still questions being raised about that, and a paper which came out at a very similar time um, was published slightly later, but I think appeared on the archive at a similar time, is by Bamba and Ogawa in PRA, volume 90, and this question, this paper raises questions about exactly how you should treat dipoles in this kind of problem and what models are appropriate to consider for dipoles. But the Vukic et al. paper makes a statement that one has to be very careful how you take a real electromagnetic system and truncate it to a single mode description. And what they try to do is provide a description where they start from a real model of electromagnetic cavity with mirrors and work out what the structure of all the modes are between the mirrors, including what the mirrors, if they were metal mirrors, what they would do to the um, static Coulomb terms. And then they, for their model, show that you can reduce it down to um, the standard Dickey model. Right, so, so, so I'm, I'm talking specifically about the question of how you deal with the interactions between different atoms. Um, yeah, you do indeed need to have the Coulomb interactions inside an atom in order to have atoms at all. Okay. So, th this is really the three sets of stories I wanted to mention in terms of um, questioning the phase transition fundamentally. Th there are two um, addenda that I should say on the end of this about what this phase transition really means. Um, the first is to say, suppose this phase transition does exist. Suppose there really is a ground state phase transition of this kind of system. We talked about it in words of light interacting with matter, but we should be very clear about one point, which is that if this is a ground state phase transition, no light comes out. Because if what you have is a new lowest energy state of the system, and you remove a photon from it, then the state you started with was the lowest energy state of the system. The state with one fewer photon is, by definition, not that state, and therefore not the lowest energy state, and therefore higher in energy. Therefore, you, removing photons from a superradiant state, a superradiant ground state, costs energy. You do not get radiation coming out of the system. Um, Another way of saying that, and this is one which um, is discussed by Chuti and Carasotto, is, is to say that when you're talking about ground state phase transitions, you have to be very careful what kinds of descriptions of a leaky cavity you could ever consider. And the point is, if I think about um, the, the description of how do you write down system coupled to an external reservoir and trace out the behavior of the reservoir, if you want to write down that there is just some rate of photons leaking out of the cavity, you need to have a bath density of states which is basically flat over the range you're, you're looking at. But the range you're looking at when you talk about phase transitions in the ground state is energy is near zero. You're, you're talking about a transition to the lowest energy state of the system and you care about what are the lowest energy photons in the outside world you could couple to, and the real density of states of photons in the outside world will vanish as you go to zero energy. There are no states with negative energy, 
And the fact there are no states of negative energy is why a transition which tries to emit a photon while increasing the energy of a system can't exist, because energy conservation would require that that outgoing photon had negative energy, but there are no negative energy states. And, and you can also think of that by saying you, you cannot write down a Markovian description which allows you to go through this phase transition. And if you write down a proper input-output formalism capturing the real density of states of the electromagnetic field outside the cavity, what you do find is that if there was a phase transition, it would really lead to a real ground state, no light would come out, and it would just be a stationary, stable state of the system. The other um, thing to then add on top of this is when you put it that way and say this is just a ground state phase transition, it doesn't produce light, it's not a perpetual light source, is to say, well, well, if I'm talking about something which involves polarization of atoms and it might have something to do with a static Coulomb interaction and it's just a ground state phase transition of the system, you start to ask the question of whether what you're really describing is a ferroelectric. Because a ferroelectric is something where the material polarizes and it's a phase transition and it doesn't produce spontaneous light. Are there any notable differences between this phase transition and, and the one which you would describe um, as a ferroelectric? And, and the particular question which comes up there is, well, in the superradiant state, what I said was there was a phase transition where there was some expectation of a photon annihilation operator, or um, I, I should perhaps write more careful versions of exactly what I mean by that, for um, limit as system size goes to infinity and symmetry breaking field goes to zero. But there is this idea that this is a state which talks about occupying photons. But one has to be quite careful what photon means. Specifically, this operator A, this thing here, um, is not gauge invariant. It, this is an operator that I used to diagonalize the problem that I had written in the Coulomb gauge, and it was a helpful computational tool to describe these harmonic oscillators. If I was working in the dipole gauge, it would also be helpful to introduce uh, photon creation and annihilation operators, but they would not correspond to the same physical observable. In, in the Coulomb gauge, I can describe actually that this A is the quantized excitations of a physical observable. It's the quantized excitations of the transverse part of the electric field. In the dipole gauge, that's not true. The operator you would define as A is the quantized excitations of a transverse part of the electric displacement, the, the, e, um, the, the um, D in Maxwell's equations, the E plus alpha um, plus epsilon naught P. And in that description, you then say, actually, these things are somewhat linked because a ferroelectric, which would have a macroscopic polarization, would, in the dipole gauge, look like an expectation of A. And actually, this is directly linked to this work um, by Vukic et al. That, that is talking about this phase transition. And therefore, this is also why the um, questions by the paper by Bamba and Agawa matter, because what they're saying is, um, you have to be quite careful how you describe dipoles and polarization of atoms due to electromagnetic field. Okay, so, so th these are really the, the, the whole set of things I want to say in my, my first section about ways that the no-go theorem could be wrong. Um, I'll pause there to see if there are any questions on, on that part before moving on. Um, I, I don't think it's in, um, impossible. I think you, I mean, you need quite a high density of superconducting qubits. So, so you need a single mode cavity and you need to put a high enough density of superconducting qubits. Do you, do you, you mean the superconducting qubit version? Yes. Um, how difficult is it to do with atoms? I think that's much more challenging because actually one of the questions which appears in a later paper by Vukic et al is if you do put these numbers in for real atoms, is it possible to get there before you've tried to build a solid by putting in the atoms so densely that it's no longer a um, simple individual atom problem? But for superconducting qubits, the numbers are not crazy. Okay, so the rest of what I want to talk about in this lecture are 
ways to get around the no-go theorem by changing the problem, and, and not by trying to describe ground state phase transitions. And I'm going to mention one very briefly and then spend the whole of the rest of the time talking about another, which is driven systems. And that the other one that I want to, to mention is to consider what happens at finite densities of excitations. And this is really, to some extent, a thought experiment, but a thought experiment which is quite closely related to real experiments on exciton polariton condensates, which is to say, suppose I have my cavity and it's closed, and it has some atoms in it, and I put in n photons, and then I just let it relax to its thermal equilibrium ground state, subject to the constraint that there are n excitations in this system, because I put in n photons to begin with. Now, there's a question here, there's a subtlety about whether I can really do this with a Dickey model that doesn't conserve excitation number. Um, there, there are ways around this subtlety, but, but I don't want to discuss those in detail. I just want to say that if I think about this as a thermodynamic problem, what, why this gets around the problem is that I replace h by h minus mu n, where n is the number of excitations, and that looks like replacing omega and omega naught by omega minus chemical potential and omega naught minus chemical potential. And what, why does that help? Well, if I go back to what I wrote on the leftmost board about what the problem was, the problem was that I needed this relation in terms of um, 4g squared n should be greater than omega times, um, uh, times omega naught, so omega naught times omega plus 4n psi, what, what I actually would need now was, is that 4g squared n should be greater than omega naught minus mu and omega minus mu plus 4n psi. And if I do the same things as before, this turns into a statement that actually what I need in terms of fundamental constants is that omega naught squared d naught 1 squared has to be bigger than omega naught minus mu times sum over charges in an atom, q alpha squared over 2m alpha. And that's no longer in contradiction with the statement that I have, because the statement that I have doesn't have mu in it. The, the, the fundamental relation between the constants is just a property of the basic properties of the atom. And so I can actually satisfy everything simultaneously, because as long as I make mu close enough to omega naught, I can make the right-hand side of this equation small, rather than trying to make the left-hand side big compared to omega naught times this sum over charges in, in an atom. So if you ask this problem not in its ground state in the um, um, canonical ensemble, but ask about this in the ground canonical ensemble, or ask about this subject for fixed density of excitations, then you find there is a phase transition, and you can draw a phase diagram, which actually is very closely related to the idea of Bose condensation of exciton polaritons, um, because you can think of these two-level systems as um, an excitonic degree of freedom and the photons as photons. And what this transition tells you is when the chemical potential becomes high enough, you get a phase transition to a state with coherent photons. And you can make those um, analogies much more um, strong, but, but I just wanted to, to stop there by pointing out this, this, this other possibility that there is a related phase transition at finite density. So I'm going to start again at the left-hand side because I'm starting on a new subject at this point. And the thing I'm going to spend the whole of the rest of the lecture talking about is how you can realize a phase transition for cold atoms in an optical cavity in a driven system, and the consequences of that in terms of how to describe this problem um, with an effective Hamiltonian. And then in my talk tomorrow morning, I will discuss that, um, that, um, the, the consequences of that, of what kinds of behavior you can engineer, and extensions beyond the model that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, by trying to satisfy that condition in that way, Yep. Automatically, it means that you 
the only way you can do it is by having a drive. Is that correct statement? Uh, so if, I mean, if you have a real cavity which has losses, you would indeed need a drive. So, so as I said, this is really a thought experiment. Um, if you want to connect it to a real physical experiment, the, the, the closest connection I, I know of is this exciton polariton case. If you go to the limit where there is a very good mirror, and therefore you need to pump it quite weakly, and there are many collisions and thermalization events that occur before anything leaks out of the cavity. I see. Okay. Uh, but this is really a thought experiment of, suppose you could build a closed box of these systems. There's no no-go theorem for a closed box at finite density. Okay. So, so the idea that I'm going to talk about is one that appeared first in a paper by Daimler et al. in PRA in um, volume 75, page 013804. And it's based on the observation that the problem we had is the fact that G and omega naught were related. And that was why this um, fix in terms of this thought experiment worked. If I separated G and omega naught, then I had some way to get around the no-go theorem. And conceptually, what you want to do is to have a two-level system where here are your two levels and the energy difference between them is omega naught, and to find a way that causes transitions between these that does not involve the direct dipole matrix element between these two levels. And so the picture introduced is, can you use a lambda scheme and a Raman transition where you absorb a cavity photon and then have stimulated emission into an external pump? So the right leg is pump and the left leg is cavity. And if you are detuned from this resonance by a large amount, so you can adiabatically eliminate this level, the picture is that you can now have a transition from this state to this state by absorbing a cavity photon and emitting one into a pump. And the crucial point is, firstly, the dipole matrix element that you use in this transition is this one, and nothing to do with this two levels down here. So the no-go theorem has gone away already. And secondly, actually, you can start to control the strength of this transition via the strength of the um, Raman driving. So, so what I actually want to do is to spend about 20 minutes or, or so, um, or maybe even longer, actually going through this problem in detail to show how this really works and to show what possibilities of engineering more, more exotic kinds of Hamiltonians come out of this. And so, so what that means is I want to take this system and say that this energy level here is at energy omega naught, this is at energy zero, this one is at omega one, delta will be um, something to do with the detuning of this pump, which is at frequency um, omega p, and derive an effective low energy description out of this Hamiltonian. So, so if I start from the physical problem, what I will have is a cavity mode and many three-level systems. And I will write these three-level systems by writing a three-by-three three matrix. And the first row, first column will correspond to this lowest state, the middle row to the first excited state, to, to this um, state that we're going to keep. So, so what I eventually want to do is to eliminate the bottom row and bot last column, and the last row and last column will correspond to this excited state that I'm going to adiabatically eliminate. And I probably haven't made that big enough to leave my space for myself. So what I should then add to this is that there are two terms that are present in here. There is a cavity which causes transitions between the ground state and the highest excited state. So I should put here terms G A plus A dagger, and here G A plus A dagger. And there is a pump which causes transitions between the middle level and the um, last level. And I will write that as two omega cos omega PT. 
and I put a factor of two because I just want to have a plus i omega pt and a minus i omega pt with an amplitude at capital omega. And then that's everything that I have here. And so what I then want to do is to find a way to adiabatically eliminate the excited state, this, this last level. And to do that, there are really two steps I need to do. One is to go into a rotating frame and to make a rotating wave approximation, because it's fairly clear from this kind of scheme that I, I should be able to be in a regime where transitions from here to here really involve um, absorbing a cavity photon, not creating one, but the counter-rotating term would be far off resonance. And this will not cause me problems for the Dickey transition that I'm going to describe later on for reasons that, that should become clear later. But I'm, I'm going to make use of the fact that actually this pump frequency and cavity frequency are really optical frequencies in the system. They're really transitions between different um, ground and excited state manifolds of an atom. And in that case, the rotating wave approximation is very good. So what I will do is to make a gauge transformation on this Hamiltonian. I will go to H tilde, which will be U dagger H U plus I dt u dagger u with a unitary transformation which will take the form of um, exponential minus i omega pump photon number plus a three by three matrix describing the action of this transform on each atom which will just make the um, which will just make the highest frequency rotate with respect to the others. And if I make that transformation, if I uh, um, apply that Hamiltonian, uh, apply that unitary transformation to the Hamiltonian, three things will basically happen. What, one thing is straightforward, I will get out of here, I will get something which involves the time derivative of this um, expression up here, I missed a T, sorry, so there's a T in here, the time derivative will just bring all of this down, I will get plus I because it's time derivative of U dagger times I, so I'll get a minus sign, and so I'll be subtracting omega P from the omega C here, and I will be subtracting omega P from this bottom right hand corner element. That's one thing which will happen and that's straightforward. The second thing that will happen is this involves um, the operator A. So wherever I have an A, I will end up with what is the transform of A. And if I look at how this unitary transformation looks, when I act with A, I will remove a photon. So I will have had one more photon for this U than I did for the U dagger. And so I will have got one more factor of E to the minus I omega P T. So all A's will acquire that phase factor and all A daggers will acquire the opposite. And I can make the same kind of statement about what would happen to any off-diagonal matrix element between the third level and any of the other two levels. So for instance, any matrix like this will also acquire a time dependence. And in this case, it will be E to B plus I omega P T times this same matrix. So, so those are the three ingredients of what happens in this transform. And if I apply those ingredients, I can then write down the transformed Hamiltonian. And I'm going to only keep those terms which are not then oscillating at a frequency 2 omega p. Because what, what this transform will really try to do is to get rid of any explicit time dependence for the terms that survive in the rotating wave approximation. So what that means is the transformed Hamiltonian will look like H tilde is omega C minus omega P A dagger A plus sum over these atoms of down here I will get just G A. And I can see why that happens just from what I wrote here. The A will acquire an E to the minus I omega P T the bottom left element acquires an overall e to the plus i omega pt, so the a dagger term will have had two phase factors, whereas the a term has two phase factors which cancel. Um, so this is the only thing which is not fast oscillating, and I'll just keep that term. If I look in the second row, I will get omega naught here, and I will get just omega. 
And again, there's one term which goes like omega, and there's one term which um, will go like um, e to the 2i omega pt, and I've, I've dropped that. The bottom right is omega 1 minus omega p, and the rest of this follows by hermeticity. So I have this plus terms of order e to the minus 2 omega pt, or e to the plus 2i omega pt, and my rotating wave approximation is that I'm going to drop all of those terms. Right, I, I, I'm never quite sure how to write this notation. What, what I mean is that before I wrote this sum over all atoms, and then I wrote a Pauling matrix, which was a two by two matrix, what I mean now is that for each atom I have a three by three matrix. Um, so, so what I, I mean, if, suppose if I wanted to write this really properly, what I should write is um, three by three identity, cross identity, cross identity, cross identity, cross this matrix, cross identity, cross identity, cross identity, and then some those for each possible place I could have inserted this matrix. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm always lacking a good notation for how do you write that succinctly. But it's, it's supposed to be that this is directly the analog of writing a sum of Pauli matrices. It's just for, well, perhaps more used to thinking of Pauli matrices as, as operators on a single atom. You used that last term. So what is the advantage of that? Um, do you mean what, what, what does this thing do? The standard, uh, the rotating frame, only the first term is used. Um, so, so, in, uh, so, so in standard rotating frame, you get rid of the time dependence of the photon and also the time dependence of the excited state of an atom. So, so this is really the, this is the excited state. This is a projector onto the excited state of the atom. Um, so, so what I'm really trying to do is to say, actually, there is a pump frequency omega p, and I want to get rid of the time dependence of this. And actually, this pump, what it does directly is couple these two states of the atom. So to get rid of that time dependence, actually, the most crucial thing is precisely this term. I've got to put in something that gives a frequency difference omega p between the second and third states of this 3x3 three three matrix. Now, the problem with doing that is that that will then introduce a time dependence between the first and second state, but I cancelled that by putting in the time dependence of the photon. So, so, so actually, the logic is really that this is what comes first. I, I wanted to get rid of the time dependence that appeared in the pump, and then what comes second is I have to make a rotating frame for the photon in order to get rid of the time independence, the time dependence that I would have introduced just by making the, the, the second transformation. Is that clear? Okay. Right. So, so actually, so far, what I've done is just simplified this a bit and got it to be time independent. I have not yet um, eliminated the excited state. And what I want to do to eliminate the excited state is to make a schrieffer wolf transformation. And the idea of this is that what I want to do is make a unitary transformation to remove the off-diagonal terms in this matrix at the expense of introducing some other terms, but really the crucial thing I'm going to try to do is to get rid of terms which couple the first two-by-two two block with the third element, and then I will have an effective two-level system description. And for wolf is based on saying that if I write a unitary transformation um, so let me suppose I don't have tildes there already and say that my new H tilde is e to the minus i s h e to the i s, where s is some Hermitian matrix that generates this transformation. If I can write h as h naught plus h1, and h1 is the thing I want to get rid of, I will tailor expand this in powers of s, and I will write this as h naught plus h1 plus i commutator of H naught and S. So this is the first order term in S because I took a 1S from here and 1S from here and get opposite signs according to which side it's on. And then the second order term will look like plus I commutator of H1 and S minus one half double commutator of H naught and S with S and it's double commutator because at order s squared, I get three kinds of terms, ones which have got minus s squared over 2 on the right, ones that have minus s squared over 2 on the left, 
and also cross terms which have got an S on either side. And if you expand this double commutator, you can convince yourself you get exactly the right signs of all of these terms. And, and the trick of the schrieffer wolf transform, um, at least if I do it just at first order, is to say, let me make this term here vanish. And I can do that because I haven't told you yet what S is. So I'm going to define that I will choose S such that the commutator of H naught and S should be I H1. And if that's true, this becomes H1 minus H1. And if that's true, and I feed this into here, then the commutator of H naught and S on this last line becomes I H1. And so actually, this whole last line simplifies quite a lot because I have the same term twice with two different prefactors. So this goes away and I just get H naught plus I over two commutator of H1 and S. So, so this is the general form of the schrieffer wolf transform. And what I should now try and do though is to implement that for the specific problem we're trying to solve here. And what that means is I should try to work out or some combination of guess and prove what form of S should I write down in order to get the, the, the um, right commutator specifically here, where what I'm going to say is that the H1 is the bits which couple the two by two block to the rest. So the H1 that I'm going to deal with is G A omega omega G A dagger, and everything else is um, H naught. Was there a question? Um, I, I'm not aware of one, I, there might be. Um, we are going to do this calculation under the assumption that the detuning is far from resonance and, that, and that's what really is controlling the perturbation theory. And that will actually be clear in just, just a second. Um, right, so I want to get that form of H1. And the thing you can almost always do with Free for Wolf is just look at the form of H1 and figure out where I better stick various operators in order that the commutator should work. So I will always, almost always want to stick in a factor of I. And I'm going to say that there are two things I want to do. I want to get a bit which cancels these. And um, I'm going to cheat slightly by knowing the answer is to stick the minus sign in the right place. But the general form is going to be that I should put one minus sign in somewhere and not a minus sign in somewhere else. And then there's going to be some denominator that I should put here. And the point is I should take this form of S and I should work out the commutator of this form of S with H naught. And what you will find is that that commutator will give you um, the same structure of matrix you had here because H naught is diagonal multiplied by energy differences between the two states that are being connected by this operator. Yeah? Yeah. Ex yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so, and so, so the, the former I should get here is the denominator should be exactly what is the energy difference between the two states that are being connected by this perturbation, and this minus sign in one place versus the other um, is really needed because of the form of the commutator and which times do you get plus the energy difference and which times do you get minus the energy difference. And in this problem, what do I mean by energy difference? Well, the two states I'm connecting are the first and third state. These differ by omega 1 minus omega p, but I'm also creating a photon, and so there's also an energy omega c minus omega p, and so it turns out that the denominator here is omega 1 minus omega p minus omega, um, so um, yeah, minus omega c minus omega p, and you can see that the omega p's cancel, and so this is really omega 1 minus omega c. I won't go through the other term in so much detail, um, but it will have a similar kind of structure. It's zero, and where I had the omegas, I get omega and minus omega. And I get I, um, and this is omega 1 minus omega p 
minus omega naught because it's now the energy difference between the third and second states. And so, so then what follows is I should now work out what is the commutator between H1 and S, and if I do that, that will give me the form of my corrected Hamiltonian, and by definition, by, by the structure that I've used, there will not be any elements here and here, because when I calculate these commutators between H1 and S, the structure I have here will say that these all have something which connects, say, the third row to the second row, and the commutator of parts from H1 will give me the part which then connects the second row to the third row back again. So I will end up only with things in the top left 2 by 2 block and the bottom right-hand component. And I will write out what you get from this. So if I calculate the commutator of I over 2 H1S, what you get is minus one half times two parts corresponding to the two things I wrote here. The first part um, ends up looking like um, one over omega one minus omega c, the same denominator I had before, and I have two g squared a dagger a, g omega a, g omega a dagger and zero, and these are definitely zero, so I won't even bother calculating them, and I won't bother calculating this because it's not important, in that I only care what happens in the bottom two by two block. And then the other contribution I get looks like one over omega one minus omega p minus omega naught, and I get a slightly different matrix here, naught here, g omega, a, G, omega, A dagger, and in the block here I get 2 omega squared. And actually, you can understand every element that showed up here by looking back at the original picture. There are four kinds of processes that are going on in this um, 2 by 2 matrix. There is the fact that if you're in the ground state, you can have a shift due to photons in the cavity, which couple to that level, that only happens for the ground state level, not the excited level, so that's a process that only appears in the top left element. For the excited level, you can have a shift due to the pump term, um, there's yeah, just a stark shift due to this pump term, that only appears in the excited state and not in the top left element. And then there is a process where you go from one to the other, absorbing a cavity photon, or you go back, emitting a cavity photon, and that gives you precisely the structure that I've written here. And I could then write out this in the form of an effective Dickey Hamiltonian. And what I will get is something which is pretty close to actually the Tavis Cummings Hamiltonian, the, the rotating wave approximation version that I wrote yesterday. But that's here the rotating wave approximation is perfectly justified. I'm assuming only the fact that the bare optical frequencies are large and nothing about the effective matter-like couplings that appear in this problem, which are these g omega over denominators. In order to write out this Hamiltonian, I'm going to assume that this detuning um, omega 1 minus omega p is much bigger than both omega naught and um, omega p minus omega c. And what that means is I can say these denominators are actually roughly both delta um, and ignore any differences between them. And then what I will get is a Hamiltonian which looks like omega naught minus 2 omega squared over delta plus 2 g squared over delta times a dagger a multiplying sigma z i over 2 plus I should write out the bit that multiplies the identity because it turns out to be non-trivial. 2 omega squared over delta minus 2 g squared over delta a dagger a times identity 2 by 2 matrices minus g omega over delta times a dagger sigma minus plus a sigma plus and then I have, in addition to all of this stuff, which is underneath this sum, 
I have omega cavity minus omega pump times A dagger A. So this is really just taking the top left two by two matrices, rearranging it into a form that I can write as sigma z plus identity. Things which are constant times identity are irrelevant, so I can ignore that and that. But there is an extra bit here, which is proton number multiplied by identity. And so that bit will actually matter because it will say that there is an effective um, cavity frequency. So the ca effective cavity frequency ends up looking like omega cavity minus omega pump minus 2g squared over delta times the number of atoms over 2. And so in one sense, there is a term here exactly like the A squared term. There's a thing which depends on the number of atoms and shifts this cavity frequency. But it's negative, um, so it's going the opposite direction. It's not making it harder, it's making it easier to condense. And secondly, there is no Thomas Wright Kuhn sum rule that connects these effective coefficients in the end. And so this is actually the, the answer to the question that I was given yesterday of why should I even bother considering phase transitions in the Tavis Cummings model? Here is an effective way to realize a model that is the Tavis Cummings model where I can tune the effective G, this is a, an effective matter like coupling, and see an actual phase transition. And this would have a phase transition when G effective squared times N is equal to omega omega naught without the factors of four. Because I can, can say, well, all of this stuff looks like an omega naught effective. And then the only thing which is a bit strange is I have this extra term here, which is photon number multiplying sigma z. This does some things, um, but if you're asking about the phase transition from the ground state, to, from an empty ground state to the superradiant state, what you can do is say, well, in the empty state, A dagger A is zero. So for that phase transition, it doesn't do anything. What it can do is produce strange things such as um, have a number of photons in the cavity shift the effective um, system frequencies and stabilize extra phases. Um, and in my talk tomorrow, I'll show one example where, where this kind of term does something um, something special. Yep. So, so it is, but, but the Schrieffer-Wolf is a perturbative expansion I need a small parameter to be dealing with. And the small parameter I'm doing this in is for detuning. So I, I, I am, I'm, but by the fact of using Schrieffer-Wolf, I am assuming certain things are true about the parameters of the model. And if those things are true, then I should have, then the rotating wave approximation is valid. So, so, so the thing is, the, the, detuning, um, it, it, the detuning is this detuning here. Um, it would be very hard to find a regime where this detuning is large, but this frequency is small as compared to the same constants, right? Um, so so the, the, this detuning is a fraction of this whole frequency. So if I can assume this detuning is large, I can pretty definitely assume that this whole frequency is, is large. And um, just to put this in some kind of characteristic scales for atoms, this is optical frequencies. So this is 100 terahertz. The detunings that people use here are um, of order 100 gigahertz, sometimes less, sometimes only 10 gigahertz, um, sometimes approaching one terahertz. The other things which have kind of scales, these Gs um, are of order um, megahertz or hundreds of kilohertz, and the omega noughts are of order kilohertz. So, so actually, this, for real atoms in a cavity with a transverse pump, these approximations are very good. And, and this is pretty much always true if you're talking about optical frequency transitions, just because that 100 terahertz scale is huge compared to almost anything else you can imagine in the problem. No, this is the next point. This is what I'm about to talk about. Any other questions? OK, so, so before saying how do I get the Dickey model, let me point out why it matters. 
because I said, well, I've got this Tavis Cummings model and this could really cause a phase transition. But if I think about a real physical system here, I have a new problem. And my, my new problem is that whereas in the ground state phase transition, I made this statement that the ground state can't emit light because it's really the ground state, now I am not talking about the ground state. Now I'm talking about the ground state in a rotating frame at a pump frequency which is somewhere up here. So if this is the density of states of um, light outside the cavity, there definitely are states at the pump frequency. There, there definitely is a possibility to decay. Moreover, because this is an optical frequency, because the pump frequency is optical, it's a very good approximation to say that this is Markovian. Um, and therefore, the real problem to describe a physical setup is this Hamiltonian plus some photon loss times Lindblad operator of photon annihilation. And this problem is very boring because this Hamiltonian conserves the number of excited atoms plus photons, and this process destroys photons. So there is only one steady state of this. It is the empty cavity with all the atoms in its ground state. And so the Tavis Cummings model plus loss is very boring because all the light escapes and there's no way to put it back and therefore you end up with an empty system. But fortunately there is a way to get around um, what, why did I get the, the setup that I got. And, and that's to say the problem with what, what I had or the, the reason that what I had gave me Tavis Cummings was my choice, and it really was a choice, of where did I draw arrows on this diagram to begin with. Because I could also have drawn a process where I said, suppose I have a pump that couples to this transition and a cavity that couples to this transition. And, and let me just, just think about this physically rather than going through the math. Physically, what that says is there is a transition where you go from a ground state to the excited state of the atom by absorbing a pump photon and emitting a cavity photon. So you excite the atom and you emit a cavity photon. And, and you can go through all of the math, and if you go through all of that math, what you will end up with is that the top two by two block of this matrix, um, which I think, yeah, I have the two by two matrices, or I have them written out in two separate halves. Um, I will get instead G omega A dagger, G omega A, the opposite way around to what I had before. And um, the omega squared bits, please get some twos, um, the omega squared bit goes up here because it's the ground state level that couples to omega, and the g squared term here goes here, um, and it's still a dagger a, and there's a one over delta in front of all of this. So, so I guess now the, the counter-rotating parts of the Dickey Hamiltonian. And so if, if you put actually all of this together, um, what you also get is there, there can be different signs on some of these terms um, and the possibility to control these all separately. So, so the net result of all of that put together is to say if you have both pumps, if you have a transition from the ground state to the excited state of a two-level system that goes via either one of these routes, then you get a Dickey Hamiltonian which will look like omega a dagger a plus sum over atoms, omega naught over two, all right, plus u um, a dagger a over two sigma i z plus g um, a dagger sigma minus plus emission conjugate plus g primed a sigma minus plus emission conjugate. And in principle, when you have two different drives controlling these two different transitions, you could separately tune the values of each of these, um, of each of these parameters on their own. And so, so actually you can realize the Tavis Cummings model, and you can realize the Dickey model, and you can realize a whole family of models with different G and G prime. And also, I should note that in this model, to some extent, every parameter is tunable. The G is tunable because it depends on the bare G times omega over delta. Similarly, G primed, 
U is tunable because it depends on the um, bare Gs and the delta, and so if you tune the deltas, the detunings of the two lasers separately, you can control separate contributions to it. Omega is tunable because it was really the cavity pump detuning, and omega naught even had some corrections due to the pure pumping term. Um, in practice, everything except omega naught is really tunable because you find that the shifts to omega naught are typically small compared to any, um, any real value of omega naught. Yeah. There are many phase transitions. Yes. Um, so, so, so I have a paper which maps out the zoology of all possible phases that you get in this enlarged phase space. Um, there are basically five kinds of things that happen. Um, four, possibly. Um, there, there is there, there are states where the ground state is stable. There are states which you have no photons, but the two-level systems all try to invert. Um, there are states where it is um, superradiant, and there are states where it is superradiant, but the photon number is not time independent, but oscillates. Then there are complexities because actually there are more than one type of superradiance, and some of these things can coexist. Um, but but if, you, so if you include the effects of cavity losses, you can actually find a phase diagram. Um, I, I believe it's this way around. I'm, I'm drawing this from memory. But it, what, what you find in this kind of phase diagram is that um, here is a state where um, it's normal and all the spins want to point down. Here is a state where it's normal and all the spins want to point up. And there is a super radiant region here. And here is actually by stable between whether it's super radiant and, or in its normal state. Um, and this line turns out technically not to be diagonal, but very close to diagonal. If you, this is putting in realistic parameters for cold atom experiments, it, it's an almost diagonal line. So, so yes, there are still phase transitions. Um, and the Dicky phase transition is um, just this side of a diagonal. Um, the very last thing I want to say, and I have just two minutes to, to say it, is um, this is all talking about a, a two levels of an atom. And these two levels I could think of as, say, different hyperfine spin states coupled via an excited state. And this is really what was proposed in the paper by Daimler et al. Um, as a way of realizing the Dickey Hamiltonian. What I will be talking about tomorrow is almost entirely, um, but not quite entirely, it, it's about a case where you realize this same kind of Hamiltonian, but using different momentum states of the atom. And I'll discuss that perhaps more briefly in the talk that I give tomorrow. Um, the idea is there you have two different low energy states, which are two different momentum states of the atom, and then two states which are excited atomic states but also with some momentum. And you say that this is the state where if I have a cloud of atoms in a cavity and I pump from the side, if I pump, there will be a, a, moment, a momentum kick given to the atoms by the pump photons. And suppose I label atoms by their momentum in the pump direction and the cavity direction. What I can do is either absorb a pump photon and go to a state which has got k plus or minus k in the pump direction and no momentum in the photon direction, uh, cavity direction, and then go to a state plus minus k plus minus k in the cavity direction, or I could absorb a cavity photon and go to this excited state. And this setup with these momentum kicks um, gives you exactly the scheme that you would you would want to have. So you have pump photon coupling that, cavity photon and pump photon coupling that. With this particular setup, you find that actually G is equal to G primed is pretty much fixed. You, you are technically different by one part in 10 to the four, but you don't have any control over that. So 
you're very much in the Dicky model limit. And this model is the model which was realized by Tillman Esslinger's group, and there's a paper in Nature from 2010 where they exactly map out the phase diagram of this model, including um, the effects of losses, because the experiment has real photon losses leaking out of the cavity. Uh, and what you see is a phase diagram, which I will also show again tomorrow, which is really measuring versus G and versus omega cavity, except on their axis it's minus omega cavity. And the, um, well, actually it's plotting G squared N on this axis. So what you would get is G squared N going like omega. But because of losses, it turns out the phase diagram is slightly renormalized. But there is a minimal critical G that you need to beat the losses, i.e. you need to do some pumping, otherwise photons just escape. And there is a super radiant region and a normal region. Okay, so that, that's where I'll stop for today. So thank you for your attention. Any questions? Well, so, so the problem is that this is all in a rotating frame. Therefore, this is not a ground state. Therefore, loss can occur and it will occur. A real cavity will have photons leaking out of this. And the problem is that with James Cummings, there is nothing here that compensates for loss. It is a Hamiltonian that conserves excitation number. So if you have an excitation number conserving process plus a photon loss process, you will end up with no photons. Whereas in the Dickey model, there is a process that creates an excited atom plus a photon. I should point out, if I had just taken the opposite driving system, i.e. just the term where you have the um, drive going from the ground state and the cavity from the excited state, that also will end up with no photons, but it will optically pump the system into the excited level. So um, if you just have, I mean, it, this is how optical pumping works. You have a one-way process which uses a pump photon and scatters protons into free space. And if that process only goes one way round, you will cause optical pumping. In the James Cummings model, it's optical pumping into the ground state.